All right. Well, welcome, Edgar, to Hygiene Elevated's podcast, Conversations and Innovations. Well, thank you for um, having me. <laughs> we are super excited, Edgar. I think you're our first non-dental person, professional that we've had on the podcast so far. Right. Um, so we're very excited to hear from you. Um, you are Edgar Hurtado of Neuro Muscle Works, and you are my massage therapist, but <laughs> you are so much more than that. So um, I'm going to kind of turn it over to you to give us as much of an introduction of yourself um, and a little bit of your background as well. So you have the floor. Awesome. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, very I feel very fortunate. And thank you. For, thank you guys again for having me. Um, I think as healthcare providers, I, it, it helps a lot to learn from one another even just, you know, digging into your guys's podcast and learning a little bit more about dent dental hygiene and whatnot made me interested into looking into TMJ issues, which is so common in my field. And, um, anytime I see a, an obstacle like that, or a, a, I guess something that most people have a hard time figuring out, it drives me into it. And I'm so stubborn, as I've told Amanda, if there's pain, there's got to be a reason or a factor behind it. Fortunately, that stubbornness and drive has gotten me to where I'm at now. I've been a massage therapist for almost 14 years now, so almost half of my lifetime. I went to UCMT, Utah College of Massage Therapy, back in 2010. Um, and never did I think I was going to become a massage therapist. I don't think any kid really grows up wishing or wanting to be a massage therapist, but it just kind of landed on my lap. Um, after high school, I went to college for about a year hated it. <clears throat> I wanted to go into psychology and I knew that was going to take a lot, a lot of time. But even back then, most people told me you're really good with your hands. I became pretty popular in high school with all the girls in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I already had that sort of reputation. Uh, but even my mom, uh, my mom would always ask me to work on her feet and stuff like that. And it just felt natural to me. Um, so when people told me you should go to massage school, I kind of laughed it off. I was like, that's a school? Like, you have to go to school to massage people? Like, don't you just do it? So <laughs> it, really, it really just uh, feels like it landed on my lap. But if we dig deep, uh, if we dig deep enough, my great grandma was a healer, massage therapist, whatever you want to call her back in our hometown in Mexico. And so there may be some connection there. I do vividly remember her grabbing me by my hands uh, many, many years ago and seeing that I had calluses on them from working out. But little did she know, it wasn't from working in the fields or working in the construction or anything like that. She uh, she never came to the States. She just saw my calluses and thought, oh man, poor kid, what's going on? Why does he have calluses? But I uh, I told her, yeah, I, I, I work, I help my dad. I grew up in a farm, so I do value hard work and have some strong ethics behind hard work. But um, she grabbed my, my hands and said, well, these hands are here to serve. And it didn't really hit me until I was in massage school where I was like, holy cow, I'm doing what my grandma did all her lifetime. Well, my great grandma, what she did for a whole, whole lifetime. Maybe there's a calling behind this. And so every day I'm excited for work. I love meeting new patients. I love running into obstacles and hard cases. Um, so it really is a driving force behind what I do. Um, my kids love it because all my kids are athletes as well. They play soccer. Some of them play, one of them plays football and the other one likes to jump on my back when I'm home because he's only two years old. So he's super active as well. But anytime they get injured or hurt, I work on them. Um, but yeah, back in 2010, went to massage school. It was a really quick, uh, you know, trade, uh, program. It took less than a year. I went there full time. And so right off the bat, I started working in a chiropractic office and it was a struggle the first couple of years as a massage as a male massage therapist it's very difficult to get that sort of clientele build up and that uh reputation going but um, a couple years later i got into a internship with real salt lake the soccer team here in salt lake city and from there i never looked back i've been working with athletes um, from the fittest of the fittest to some of the greatest players in the world um, to, you know, average nine to five workers, uh, dental hygienists, uh, professionals in the field. Um, and I love it. Every, every body that I get to work on teaches me something new for the next individual and the next person. 
and I take that as a, as a huge advantage. Um, people forget that this is a practice and we got to practice it to figure out how we can resolve and help other people as we go along. But yeah, 14 years in the field, uh, and every day I'm still learning. Like I said, just recently, this whole PMJ scenario came because of working with you and also because I've had some patients that have complained about TMJ and I just had to dive into it a little bit more to understand it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I've hit some, some strides with that as well. So many things that you just said right there, like you, you nerded out and that is perfectly acceptable for your field. That's like a glimpse of like how we, whenever we talk to each other and we like um, have that conversation with somebody that's on that same wavelength, like, yeah, we'll nerd out about periodontal ligaments and biological whips yes. and what, what have you. But you said something that kind of struck me as funny, not haha -ha funny, but I think the same thing is true in dental hygiene. Male hygienists are, are the minority mm -hmm. um, and still phenomenal, of course. Um, I just had never even thought about a male massage therapist having having that challenge um, to create a clientele for yourself. So that was very interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Well, it's, listening it's, to you speak, I thought, oh my gosh, I need to make an appointment <laughs> like, right now. I'm in love. I have to come now. <laughs> five minutes in. Let's go. <laughs> Joffrey's family does jujitsu and your daughter is a gymnast. So they're all athletes. <laughs> so they, they do need to see you. My last patient today, he's been doing jujitsu for quite a while. And yep, I definitely see the need for it in that field or in that uh, sport. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so as we're going to dive a little bit more into your career first off that story with your great grandma like that was beautiful like the idea of these hands are for serving like in hygiene especially too that's exactly our our livelihood is our hands right. and that's how we treat our patients and you especially like you are you have more tactile sensitivity than we do because you are just using your hands to feel so many things and so many layers of tissue, adipose tissue, muscle tissue, all of those things. Um, you've been practicing 14 years. How would you describe what you do as different than like going to, not bashing anybody, but like a massage envy chain um, versus what you do? Because you're a pioneer in your field. Um, I can attest to that as going through many, many massage therapists. And um, you are very different in how you approach problems, but how you treat problems. So go for it, Edgar. Yeah. So I do believe there's a time and a place for all modalities, even a massage envy setting. Um, I think it's a great way to introduce somebody into massage. Mm -hmm. um, as far as what I do, I, I consider it to be more of an orthopedic type massage or more uh, injury massage. Um, but what I've, what I've dove into is more on the neurological perspective. So more working with the connection between the nerves and the muscles. Um, in most massage therapists in the beginning, we're just working on muscles. We learn the anatomy. Uh, if somebody says my shoulders hurt, we work on the traps and the deltoids and whatnot. But what I guess makes me a little bit different is that I don't just want to work where it hurts. I want to work why it hurts. And I think that's a, a big issue even in our medical field where we're just treating the symptoms rather than fixing the actual problem or hitting the root, root cause. And so, mm -hmm. and that's why I named my business Neuro Muscle Works because our muscles will be tight even without us asking them to be tight. And that's my main focus. I work on hypertonic muscles, which uh, can develop over prolonged positions, sitting down for too long or being in awkward postures for too long or overusing them or even underusing them, neglecting them. So if you think about it, there's no way of escaping it. We're gonna have hypertonic muscles throughout our whole body. Mm -hmm. And that's my approach. I work on why things are hurting rather than where they're hurting. Um, one thing that I always tell patients, I'm gonna work where it hurts because you expect me to. I'm gonna work everywhere else because I know better. And so we tie it all together where it's from head to toe, there's gonna be, right now I have close to a hundred or maybe even a little bit more now, a hundred muscles that I could point out on any human anatomy, any human body. And I could already tell you, this one's going to be weaker than the one on your left or vice versa. And that has come um, to me from doing so many assessments. 
Um, so in my approach, I do uh, manual resistant test. So it's basically like muscle testing, but I'm not necessarily looking to see how strong a muscle is. I just want to know if you're stable enough to hold that resistance. And when a muscle is hypertonic, it's already overworking, even when you're not asking it to work. So think of it like an outlet that has too much power coming out of it. At some point, it's just going to shut off. It's going to fuse out. So you got to go to the switchboard and flip it back on, right? So if there's too much power going out and we add a little bit more resistance on that test, it'll come off as weak. And so going back a couple steps down, there is what we call um, muscle activation. Mm -hmm. That's used by a lot of chiropractors. That's used by physical therapists. And it gets a lot of bad reputation from that perspective that it makes it sound like the muscle's off or not working. I switched that language to understand that it's actually overworking by adding that test or that resistance. We can prove that because the muscle will just shut off in a way to uh, protect yourself or as a defense mechanism. So what distinguished me from, let's say, a massage envy is that most places like that won't do an assessment. They'll just basically work where it hurts and it feels good. There's a lot of benefits and therapeutic um, benefits from that approach as well. But is it taking care of the root cause or the issue? Most likely not. And that's where we get stuck in the hamster wheel where we keep going back for the same issues and the same problems. Uh, with me, we actually scale it. Every session is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. uh, it's rare when we have to work on the same muscles because they, the moment that we are able to restore function and back into them, they just get better the, lo the, the more we go along. But there are so many muscles, just not enough time. I always tell people people that um but with each session it's it's a it's a breakthrough each session yeah and, i i can personally attest to that and i finally as edgar knows talked my husband into going yep. um be, with tr like he had so much trauma in his back and um when i picked him up from from your office he was like that was so crazy mm -hmm. he did like and he was describing the tests and everything and he's like i should be able to throw him across the room and right. I couldn't like throw him across the room with my leg. Right. And so he was like honestly taken back. And I think one of the things that I appreciated about my session with you, that first session, um, was the education that you put into it and the visuals um, mm -hmm. in helping to explain to me what's going on in my case and then the visuals of what's going on and then the communication of um, hey, this is where I want the pressure point to be. I want you to be at like an eight and not above that or a seven and not above that. Mm -hmm. And so there was the the whole experience was completely different um, when I went in um, because I saw you initially for like tingling that was going up my neck and it's my left side, but you worked on my right side and it was like, okay, I'm game, yeah. I'm game for this. Um, and that tingling, in the neck hasn't come back which is phenomenal to me and so i've been i've been an edgar sellout ever since um but it's your method um that that had me coming back um obviously you got to the root cause but um just the fact that it was so different than anything else i had experienced before i was like this guy knows his stuff really well um and is going to the next level so I'm grateful as a hygienist that I have found you, um, but that you're doing what you are doing and being a pioneer in your field, because there's not just this this um, drive, I think, in a lot of people to find that root cause, but to just get you on a regular recall, I guess. Yeah. So well, I'll, I'll throw this in there. Yeah. I, I don't like to say that I fix people. <laughs> Even though people say, like, oh, you fix this, you fix that, like, the body's doing the best it can with what it has. Mm -hmm. Most people have hypertonic muscles. My job is to just facilitate that and restore those tissues so that your body does better. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, yeah, it, absolutely. In, in my field, in my scope of practice, I can't necessarily diagnose anything. Everything I do is based off of a hypothesis, mm -hmm. based off of the thousands of patients before you that have helped me formulate this approach. Um, and when you say that I'm a pioneer in this, I do believe I am, and it's kind of scary and creepy to me because I'm like, I can't be the only one that has figured this stuff out. But I don't so much present like a technique or a form of working. 
but I do feel like I could present a framework, framework, a conceptual framework to how to treat these issues and how to work them. I do believe that almost any modality could help if we knew how to find the real issue. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so with, with what I feel like I present to the medical field and anybody that's listening, because I'm always willing to you know take on uh, apprenticeships and uh, therapists that are just starting out, what I feel like I could present to the world is that there is a neurological pattern to the human body. Um, it's been so many years of me look, looking and searching if there's already something out there like this. I haven't found it yet. I'd love so, for somebody to reach out and say, yes, there is a pattern, so I don't have to work as hard to figure them out. <laughs> but I also love that drive. I also love the challenges. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to see what the future holds. Edgar, I got to back up here. You said you can't diagnose and that just like resonated because Amanda and I can't diagnose anything yeah. either. Right. But we, we can't trained. diagnose. <laughs> yeah. We spent years learning <laughs> all of these things and we can't diagnose. You said that and I was like, oh my gosh, yeah. me, me either. <laughs> Yet we treat people, of course, yeah. but not yeah. with a diagnosis, with, with that knowledge, that working knowledge of if I have X and I do Y, I will more than likely get Z. Yeah. And yeah. So. And I, and I think diagnosing is this, the easy thing to do. Figuring out why it happens is the work part. Mm. So once again, like if you have tendinopathy, it's like, okay, cool. But why? Right. So that's where I, once again, I don't necessarily work on the diagnosis or the problem or the pain, I guess. I work on the actual reason for why you're having that pain. Well, and that's okay. why I go to you. Edgar, that's literally what um, the hygienists are doing too. Like we'll yep. identify somebody as being high risks for getting dental cavities. And yeah. our job is to figure out why, why are you getting these so we can stop it from happening mm -hmm. where the doctor is more like, okay, let's fix, let's that. fix it and then right. move on. But our job is more of like, why? Right. Yeah. We're the root cause people. We mm -hmm. are like, I can help keep you from having to fix this if we can figure it out. So that is so many similarities here, but yeah, that's like, I think a drive for us is like that. Okay. Let's figure out what either medical condition, lifestyle choice right. you're making that's causing this. For sure. So no, so much of it. That's so cool. So kind of going back to your technique, neuroactivation, what is that for people who have never heard that term before? What do you, how would you describe that? So anything that relates to the, the central nervous system, anything that can stimulate the central nervous system, that could be uh, through trigger point, that could be through specific uh, pressure points on the muscle, or even just uh, certain exercises that can re-educate the tissues that you're trying to restore or work with. Um, what I see <clears throat> in the field right now, which, like I said, most physical therapists um, do a lot of, a lot of neural neuromuscular reteaching, neuromuscular reactivation through exercises. What I see right now is that we're doing it from a conscious perspective. It's it's very good when you can do the exercises when you have somebody cueing you to do it. But if you're doing, let's say, a sport where you're not having the time to cue yourself to properly throw a ball or uh, how to properly squat when you're going in for a rebound or whatever, um, you want it to be more from a subconscious level. And I feel that massage therapists, we get so much time with the patient that we can address that more from a subconscious level. Um, when we go back to that hypertonic muscle, I don't let go until it's done. And you've experienced this too. Yes. Uh, I don't I don't move until I, I can physically and also intuitively feel that the muscle has released and the patient can feel it as well. Um, so going back to neuromuscle activation or neuromuscular neuromus approaches right now, we're doing it all from a, from a conscious perspective. We're, we're trying to reteach our, our body to do something from a conscious level, but as a, as a massage therapist, from my approach, we wanna get into the subconscious uh, level, which is the hardest to get to. And it takes the longest as well, but I see it be more uh, beneficial long-term. I've seen cases from six years ago that the same muscles we've worked on are still on and rocking, they're feeling good where with physical therapy, in, at least in the standard physical therapy approach right now, as soon as you're done doing the physical therapy, you might go back to the same problem or a reoccurring issue, which like I said, 
there's a time and a place for it. I see what I'm doing as the foundation. Physical therapy will even be 10 times better after that, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Um, yeah. For, from, from my approach, it should be more from a subconscious level, teaching the muscles to respond even when you're not conscious of them doing those motions. And, and working with athletes has gotten me to that level of understanding uh, because they do a lot of rehab as well after an injury. But most athletes, let's say they have an ankle sprain, they're more prone to have further issues like with the hamstrings or uh, their hips or whatever. So I see that physical therapy is missing that aspect that we want to start working with the subconscious before we work on the conscious. That's that is like beyond next level. Um, I mean, Joffrey, have you ever encountered like in any ergonomic course that you've taken or even heard of, like trying to get to a subconscious, like perfect posture? Basically, that's one of the things that we're always striving for in hygiene is ergonomics, ergonomics. Um, and we have a lot of equipment that helps us with that, but nothing to train us mentally. Have um, you? No, I haven't. But the I was so intrigued when we when uh, to even learn about what neuroactivation was going to be. Um, <laughs> Edgar, I think we just tapped you into a new niche. There's going to be a ton of dental hygienists now. Yes. Like, teach us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have the list of muscles that most likely every every hygienist will be having a struggle <laughs> with. It's just a matter of working on them. It's just a matter mm -hmm. of restoring. Uh, my motto is re uh, release, restore, rise. So release, restore, rise so that you can perform to your optimal level. Because I, I see it every day. I see, like I said, in the beginning when we do an assessment and you can't hold your leg steady or, you know, whatever assessment we're doing, it almost seems like impossible. But once we work on it and retest it at the end, you're like, I couldn't do that before. Mm -hmm. like your husband experience, as most patients experience, they're like, wait. Yeah how come I can do it now? Is this magic or how did I get more strength? No, we just simply restored function back into that tissue to where you don't have to think about it as hard anymore. It just comes natural. Yeah. And I think we see that with toddlers. I think we see that a lot with younger kids. They have pretty good posture in comparison to an adult or a teenager. So I do feel that um, our natural ability is to have stability. Our, our stability is more related to our central nervous system, to our spinal cord. And that's why a baby might not have a lot of strength, but it has stability. It can protect its neck and protect its little torso whenever it's trying to roll over or you set them up on a desk. Most toddlers have pretty good posture, most babies. And so I do feel that we need to focus more on stability before strength, which right mm -hmm. now in the industry, I think we focus so much on strengthening and strengthening. Well, in my perspective, the more you try to outstrength a lack of stability, the more likelihood you're going to create compensations and eventually injury. So we want to fix the stability issue from that subconscious uh, perspective. And posture improves. I've seen it all the time. I've seen people's posture improve a lot faster than, you know, forcing yourself to sit up straight every time because we forget our body's going to go back to that habit if uh, those muscles aren't performing to their optimal level. There's a huge hot, hot topic right now in dental hygiene. And I mean, even within all of the medical field right now, but burnout, like physical burnout, like there's a, there's definitely an emotional um, component to that. But I think a lot of it is physical too. Um, within my first year of practicing, I pinched my sciatic. Um, and I mean, fortunately I was young, so I was able to recover and I probably didn't go about the best way of having it um, fixed, <laughs> if you will. But um, that was a very serious injury very early on in my career that really kind of freaked me out. And I kind of tried to work a little bit more on my posture, you know, without any sort of guidance from a professional such as yourself. Um, but I think you, I'm all, we need more of you in our field to help us physically be able to be present and not have those nagging aches at the end of the day that really wear on you. Because when your body hurts, like it, it really does wear on you mentally as well. So there's a huge factor there, I think, um, that could help with burnout in careers, any career. Yeah, 100%, I agree. 
uh, I work with a lot of young athletes as well. <clears throat> and so I'm excited for their future because I'm getting to catch these neurological inhibitions or hypertonic muscles at an early stage to where maybe they'll be able to uh, play longer. You know, you see uh, athletes like uh, LeBron James and uh, what's his name, Tom Brady, they're high maintenance. They have to get body work done every single day. I feel that if we did this approach, it would be less high maintenance. It would be more yeah. restorative to where it doesn't, you don't have to overdo it to try to catch up from years of abuse and years of wear and tear. So yeah, I'm excited for the youth that I'm working with right now because I feel like this will prolong their careers. This will keep them from having early injuries. Um, Cause a, a thing about injuries is that tissues heal, you know, our bones will heal after you know several months, uh, soft tissue, usually around 90 days, it can fully heal, but our central nervous system doesn't forget. And it'll keep that information stored to avoid another injury from happening. So we never really reach that uh, full recovery from a neurological perspective because we still have that fear of re-injury. Mm -hmm. So with muscle activation or neuromuscle works, I feel that we can hit the reset button to where you now have that confidence again and you're not so scared to re-injure the, the same uh, tissues. Um, and so, yeah, I, I do believe that more therapists should have this approach. Um, yeah. I think it's like I said, revolutionary, if it is something that I'm pioneering in. Um, and, and yeah, it's humbling, but it's it's exciting at the same time. Yeah, so Edgar, uh, the last, uh, I, I do some, I do speaking for dental hygiene students prior to graduation. And mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the presentation, it turns into Q&A. And one of the students had asked me, she, she was, um, a little concerned like hey i've never done a full schedule before like how do we prevent burnout when i've only seen like one patient a day how do i handle a full schedule um without hurting my body and i was like well um you know i my, my initial reaction to the or answer to that question was is it the schedule's fault that your body's hurting or is it your fault I, did you hold your instruments wrong? Did you have bad posture? Did you do something crazy to clean the teeth? Like, you know, if your body's hurting, you probably need to just take it back to the basics and make sure you're using all those ergonomic tips and tricks that your um, educators and clinical instructors have been like instilling in you since day one. Like if your body's hurting, it's likely your fault, not necessarily your schedules. And... <laughs> Um, I'm not now I'm like, oh, that was actually a really good answer <laughs> after yeah. hearing you talk. So sounds like such wisdom, Joffrey. <laughs> well, especially with like working out, right? A lot of a lot of times I'll get patients in here that say, Oh, I lifted wrong. Or I have patients that say I slept wrong. Mm -hmm. how, how do you sleep wrong? So it's all going back to the working out, I think working out should be used more as a diagnostic tool to know how healthy your body is feeling rather than using symptoms as like, oh, something's broken, something's damaged. Don't wait for the symptom. Use working out as your measuring stick. Do I feel my age physically? Because we all have a chronological age, but we also have a biological age. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people are a lot older biologically because of the lack of exercise or the lack of um, resistance training. But use that, use the working out as a diagnostic tool to see like, oh, how does my body feel when I run a mile? How does my body feel when I try to lift 50 pounds versus you know 20 pounds? So use working out as that measuring stick rather than blaming the working out as the reason why, why you got injured. Um, it'll expose these neurological inhibitions a lot sooner, which is great because I'd rather people come in when they're 20, 30, rather when rather than when they're 60 or 70 um, because it's it's not harder to restore function but there's that potential that there is some damage by that point yeah um, the, the best way that I can explain that is that neurological inhibitions lead to postural distortions and we can point out postural distortions in somebody's posture and the way they move the way they live but those postural distortions can lead to tissue danger which equals pain you can have danger that relates to pain. The reason why I say danger is because you could do an MRI or an X-ray and see that there's nothing broken, there's nothing torn. You just got to rest, right? That's what most doctors say. You know, just take a break, recover, 
It's like, why do I hurt? Mm -hmm. That signals related to the danger. Your body knows what's wrong. It's just trying to tell you through danger. But eventually that danger can become damage. So most times when you have damage to the tissues, you are going to have some pain as well. So neurological inhibitions lead to postural distortions, forward head carriage, rounded shoulders, hyperkyphotic spines, you name it. That leads to tissue danger, eventually damage, but they both equal pain. I feel so, like he just called us out for all of our like shoulders and <laughs> everything like that. And that took time, right? We, 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 we obviously could, like I said, we can point that out. Is it an issue right now? Maybe not. But if you do some overhead presses or any sort of overhead movements, you might have some shoulder issues or neck issues down the road. But once again, we can do something about it. If those muscles are guarding or uh, hypertonic, why not address it before it becomes an issue? Yeah, 100 percent. Don't wait till it hurts. I mean, the sooner the better. Yeah. Pain's a good motivator, but it's not the best indicator to the problem, right? So. so many parallels between dentistry and massage therapy. We say the same thing, like pain's a great motivator, but if you wait till it hurts, it's usually too late to save right. the tooth or whatever. Exactly, so. exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you had mentioned um, that you got an internship with the Real. Mm -hmm. um, what type of like um, cross, um, Gosh, what's the word I'm trying to use here? Um, integrative practices with other um, professionals. So not just massage therapists, because you work with Dr. Alex as well, correct? Correct, yeah. So describe describe how that relationship is and what that looks like um, professionally. Of course, yeah. So with Dr. Alex, he's a uh, naturopath. He has obviously a wider scope of what he can do and one of the quotes that I, I like to repeat is that I'm good, but I'm not God. So there are some cases that I might not be able to help you with, with what you have going on. Maybe we can uh, prevent it from getting worse, but there's cases where I might refer out to Dr. Alec for some PRP injections or platelet rich plasma to help restore the tissues from within. Um, so yeah, as far as like the connections that I have, I have a, a podiatrist up at the U. I also work with the University of Utah with oncology patients. Um, a lot of, um, not just naturopaths, but there's another one. I can't remember what her title is, but she's amazing. Uh, so anytime I run into an issue like that, I'll refer to obviously somebody with, with that level of uh, expertise. Um, I'd, I'd love to share a story where I yes. had that realization. I had a patient that came in with sciatic pain and sure enough, I did all the all the the protocol and, and my general assessments and whatnot, and everything turned out that yeah, the muscles that are typically off are off. We would work on them, and then the next time I saw him, they were off again, which is rare. I said, okay, we'll try it again. We worked on the same muscles. Following week, they were off again. That's where I was like, okay, something else is going on here. This is beyond me. This is uh, maybe a little bit more complicated than what I can do. So I said, tell your physical therapist, because he was also going to physical therapy, tell your physical therapist that you need an MRI. I can't prescribe it for you, but maybe through him, you can get it. Uh, the next time I saw him, he said, my physical therapist says that sciatica takes time and that we're just going to continue with the exercises. And I told him, no, there's something else going on. Trust me. I trust my pattern so much that I knew something else was going on. Well, a couple weeks later, he finally got the MRI, and it turned out he had a grade two tumor growing in his spine, in the lumbar spine. So that tumor was obstructing the, the neurological connection to those muscles, creating some sciatic-like type pain. So it was, it was bittersweet. Obviously, I didn't want to hear that coming from a patient of mine, but I said, okay, well, obviously, you got to take care of it. The, the surgery was done. That same day, I asked him, how's that sciatic pain? He said, I don't feel it. I don't have sciatica anymore. I was like, okay, well, maybe it's because of the surgery, the anesthesia, whatever. Let's wait a couple of days. He hasn't had sciatica for over a year. So that issue in his spine was creating sciatic-like pain to where I would address the muscles that typically would help with sciatica. I ran into a roadblock where that same issue was coming back. I knew something else was going on. So there's definitely cases where I tell patients, look, 
I'm good, but I'm not God. There might be something that I can't help you with, but I definitely have the resources to refer you out. And and I'd love to have that connection because the more tools we have under our belt, the less likelihood we'll treat every case the same. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. Again, so many parallels between yeah. what you do and hygiene where, you know, we'll see a patient and I mean, everybody likes to say, oh, my, if, if we see bleeding, they're like, oh, I just have sensitive gums. And it's like, yeah, there's more going on here than just bleeding gums. Like, um, I actually just had a patient on Thursday. She's a regular three month recall patient. And I was like, you are bleeding a lot. Are you okay? Like, have you been stressed? And she just kind of started pouring out a story but she was telling me that her um, insurance quit covering her diabetic medication. So her doctor suggested that she let her blood sugar go up. So that way insurance would see that she needs that medication and wow. it has thrown off everything for her. Yeah. So she was a bloody mess. I mean, obviously that's not the same level as, as what you are doing there, Edgar, but just those those things that we see when we know something's not right here. Sure. Um, this is more than just, oh, I forgot to floss. I have bloody gums. When right. you see that those patterns of what you do, just something is not the same. You have to look at, at the whole body more than just like your specific scope. There's something bigger going on here. And right. so that's definitely something I respect largely about your field and your your approach and your practice. Amanda, I'm thinking about when we find um, a lesion in the mouth and we just, our heart and gut just tell us like, no, that, oh. that is not right. You need to go get a biopsy. And then mm-hmm. they'll come back with, you know, some type of oral cancer. Yeah. Um, but when you, you get that, that gut feeling, you're like, oh, I know this is not right. Right. Yeah. I think that's, that's definitely a good marker of a healthcare provider, like somebody that's in tuned. And I think you were talking about this a couple of weeks ago, Joffrey, like being present and not just being on autopilot because Edgar, in your line of work, I couldn't imagine you not being present, like with how you work, like you are working in so many levels, you have got to be picturing everything that you're doing with your hands. And I mean, the same in, in hygiene, like it's, we, we could probably zone out a little bit easier than you, but not being present there's so much that you can miss as a provider in right. not not being engaged and thinking about things a hundred percent for sure yeah I, I you said there's so many so many layers i feel like it's like a matrix inside our body <laughs> uh, because of the fascial layers the muscle layers um even with my approach like in massage therapy there's what we call energy work right so there's, there's modalities out there where they don't even touch the body, right? Um, and once again, there's a time and a place for everything, but how, um, have you guys ever heard of Reiki? Reiki yeah. is so much, yeah. Have you ever had a session in Reiki? I've never had Reiki. I don't fully know what it is, but I have heard of it. Yeah, so it's definitely more like Eastern medicine and it's definitely a lot of energy work and whatnot. And some patients rave it, some patients love it. But with what I do, since I'm working on so many layers, I feel that there is some sort of energy work behind it as well, because I always question myself if I'm, if I'm working on the, let's say the traps, the upper trap, it's the most superficial layer there. How come it doesn't also affect the splenius capitis, which is a lot deeper in there, or the multifidi of the cervical spine. But I feel that being present and consciously thinking of the muscle in some weird metaphysical way changes that. So as far as being present, I have to be because I'm literally envisioning which muscle I'm trying to work on. And it's weird because I'll do the assessments and do the tests and you can distinguish the results based off of those tests. Like, oh, I worked on the trap and the assessment comes out positive where it's now restored. Then we uh, address the splenius capitis and it's not. So it's kind of a weird concept that I have that there is some sort of energy work behind it because you have to vividly um, picture those muscles and definitely be present the whole time. Okay, Edgar, here, this is just another parallel with dental hygiene because, uh, you know, if somebody has like 
bone loss, right? And we are cleaning between the tooth and the gum where we can't see. We are literally just cleaning around the root of the tooth with like, just by feel, like, what does it feel like? You know, we know the shape of that tooth, uh, the morphology of it. We, but we can't see what we're cleaning. We just have to like use our tactile sensitivity to get in there and get it out. Like if you're not paying attention, you're not going to get it all. Miss it easily. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, there's so many parallels. <laughs> so many different impacts, though. Mm -hmm. um, so what have been some of the biggest challenges in your career? Going from starting out, you know, not even thinking about massage therapy as a career to going to school to getting your internship to where you are now. What what were the biggest challenges that you faced? So, I mean, if we go back, like in the beginning, going back to burnout, right? Because you mentioned something about burnout. Um, I did experience that like the first year or two years, but it wasn't so much physical. It was more emotional. It mm -hmm. was more like every time I got a patient in that was suffering and a lot of pain, it, it almost seemed like I was absorbing their pain, absorbing their their problems and their issues. So that was one obstacle that I had to figure out how to fix. Um, eventually, rather than absorbing, I decided that I needed to observe. Rather than absorb, I gotta observe. I gotta observe this case because this case is gonna help me for the next patient that comes in with maybe a bigger problem. And after dealing with so many people, like there is some psychology aspect to it that um, pain is attached to. So that helped me understand like, okay, this patient is here for the next hour, hour and a half. I can't maybe fix their problems completely, but I'm gonna do everything I can to, to, to uh, make them at least feel better than when they came in. So that was one obstacle that I had to detach myself from that I wasn't gonna absorb their problems, but rather I, had, I needed to observe and learn from this patient. And so that's been my motto with every patient that I work with, I'm gonna learn something new that's a huge takeaway. Sorry, like, not to take away from that moment, but like that's, I mean, that applies to any, any profession. That is incredibly profound. Like the fact that you kind of stopped and like noticed that, walked away and solved a problem like that, that's, that's huge, Edgar. Because like I said, I was burned out emotionally. I was like, this isn't uh, like hard on my body. I left to work out, I left to be, you know, active. So it wasn't much, much physical. But at the end of the day, I just felt drained. And so I had to figure out, well, why am I feeling this way? And then I realized, oh, it's because I'm putting so much emotional energy behind this that I'm left drained at the end. And one of the best like uh, metaphor that I have is that a, a candle loses nothing by lighting up another candle or a thousand candles, right? And eventually, you know, we're not going to live forever. This candle is going to run out at some point, but I want to light up as many candles as I can while I'm here. So that was something that I needed to take, that the energy that I have is mine, the energy that that patient has is theirs, but we can work together to figure out a solution to their problem. So that was definitely that was definitely an obstacle in the beginning. Um, the drink. Well, I have a question. Yeah. When you were, sorry, in the middle of that like burnout, did mm -hmm. you ever consider, okay, I need to do something else? Or were you like, no, I'm gonna find a solution? Well, to get a little personal, I was also going through a, a divorce. My, oh. my, my divorce so and i had two little boys at the time so it was really draining from both angles right yeah and then i had to realize i'm doing a disservice by bringing my baggage into this so yeah. i learned from that point point forward when i'm on this uh in this room with this patient i'm here for them forget what i'm going through because if i'm carrying this with me the the results weren't the same I felt like I was a disservice to that patient because I wasn't fully present and I wasn't fully there. So um, what was your question again? <laughs> Sorry. Did you ever consider like leaving the field? The reason why I bring that up is because I said, okay, I'm going through a divorce. I'm going to need to make some more money. Maybe I should go work in construction or go do oil rigs. And I literally thought about that for a second. It was a crossroads. I'm glad I did not because uh, it's paid off. But definitely that that time in my life was a little bit more stressed out and more chaotic than it is now. But that taught me to handle other situations that might be even worse than what I went through because you never know what you could go through. But as far as detaching myself from what I'm going through outside of these doors, 
was the best thing I could do as far as uh, learning how to detach myself from that patient as well was the best thing I could do. And I could just focus on, you know, helping. What, um, what would you say your like key there in being able to detach from a patient, say it was unsuccessful, or even if it was successful, what is it for you that helps you to detach from like their energy, their emotions that you were feeling? Listening, just listening to the person, listening to the patient, uh, empathy, you know, rather than having sympathy and feeling sorry for that patient, I want to have empathy and put myself in their shoes. What would I do if I was in their shoes? Um, kind of funny uh, with my mom too. She's suffered from, you know, um, shoulder issues and low back issues. So I would always look at a patient and be like, if this was my mom here right now, what would I do for her? So having empathy is one one way that I do it. Um, I think gratitude, just being thankful that this patient has uh, enough trust in me to see if I can help them out. Uh, gratitude enough to say, I'm going to learn something from this patient right now. Um, so I would say empathy and gratitude are the main things that I use to apply that. I love that perspective. I think gratitude goes a long, long way in just putting you in the best mental place that you can possibly be. Right. So that's phenomenal. Edgar, you mentioned like you absorbed their energy and then you made that switch to starting just to observe it. Um, and that really just resonated because as the, the provider, when we're dealing with our patients, there comes like a times where uh, you accidentally absorb it. Like you didn't even want to, uh, or you're, those were not your intentions. Uh, you know, I had a, a teenage girl who had these braces on and her gums were just overgrowing the brackets. It was just very challenging uh, to take care of her. And um, it was so painful to touch those gums. So I'm like, listen, we really need to get your your gums numb so that I can clean this so we can get it better. And the little girl, you know, teenage girl, she's just like so scared of the needle and tears rolling down her face. And all I could think of was like, oh my gosh, you're almost the same age as my daughter. Like I would feel so sad if, if this was my daughter right now, like who's terrified but in such a bad condition, you know, like you have to fix it. You have to do it. But, oh my gosh, it she, her, just her tears just like broke, breaking me emotionally. I was just like, oh, you sweetheart. I'm so sorry we have to do this. Um, but then I was like literally drained for the rest of the day. Cause I, I just like took too much, too much of her energy in. Right. So you don't want it to happen, but sometimes it just sneaks up on you. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think there's a seed of positivity in anything. Um, I think one way that you could look at it is using her story. You know, how, how could we prevent or at least lay, uh, add a layer of protection from that happening to somebody else? So that's that's one way that I could look at that situation. Like, so I don't have to see more people go through what she went through. What preventative measures could be taken to not get to that point if there is any? And if there's not, you know, Let's figure them out. There might be, there might be a, a way to prevent that happening to somebody else. I think we need a world with more of you in it, Edgar. Uh, yeah, <laughs> a seed of positivity. Like you're, <laughs> when your hands give out, you're just gonna write these inspirational quotes for all of us to I, with. genuinely either write a book or you can become a motivational public speaker because right. be fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to kind of wrap up with our last two questions, unless there was something specific that you wanted to share with us, Edgar. Um, no, I mean, I think we've covered, uh, you, you asked me about my story. You asked me about what got me here. I always tell patients, I'm just stubborn. I want to figure things out. I feel like all the answers to the universe can be answered through our, through our bodies, through our minds, through our, the way that our body functions. So. Um, I hope collectively people understand that the more we hear stories like this and the more we get to communicate with one another, um, the more we realize we're all kind of living in the same flow or the same pattern. And, and I definitely want people to take some, some uh, advice, like just learn from every situation, from every, every patient that you interact with in any field. I think in any, in any job, like you can learn something from 
everybody that you work with. I, I completely agree with that. Um, yeah, if you're not learning from each situation that you're you're in, you just you don't remember it and you don't grow as a person. And I think as a provider, if you're not learning with each of those encounters that you have with a challenge or whatever type of situation, it's an opportunity to learn and grow and just become better. So I think it is important to really be alert, be in pre be in like the present, be present and um, have those takeaways. So, well, our last two questions, Edgar, because you're our first non-dental person, we had to kind of change these a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, what, well, let me get there. What do you wish you would have learned in school that took you years as a practitioner to learn? that the word practice like in a medical practice massage practice means just that it means you have to practice it you have to apply it you have to learn you have to realize that you're never going to stop learning um so definitely use that word practice and apply it every day um once again not to bash on the medical field but i feel like we rely just on the textbook and that's it and that's all there's going to be and we forget to learn from every body, every patient, every case. So that's one thing I wish I would have learned earlier. That way I wouldn't have ran into so many roadblocks or just gave up in some cases. Um, so use that word practice and apply it every day. Um, not be afraid to be, not be afraid of the hard challenges either, because there's, there's an answer to everything. It's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of being patient and using all the resources. So definitely, uh, understanding that word practice after whatever title you have, uh, hygienist practice, dental practice, massage therapy practice, medical practice, keep practicing because there's, it's going to help somebody out. <clears throat> All right, Edgar, last one here. What piece of advice do you wish you could go back and give yourself as a new graduate? What piece of advice? Okay. Uh, dang, that's a good one. <laughs> be precise and i'm looking at i'm looking at my little uh fountain hand that i have because it's like it's like running water and it's like holding the two fingers like this but you have to be precise on what you want out of your career um which i have another story if you guys don't mind hearing but oh let's hear it <laughs> so when i was at massage school precisely um we were supposed to write it well we wrote a letter to ourselves from five years in the future. So basically saying like, hey, you're five years in, this is what's going on, right? So in that letter, which I still have, I wrote that I was working from, I was working with athletes from all over the world, that I was working with football players, because football is my favorite sport, that I ride a helicopter to work, <laughs> and, uh, and a few other things. But of course, five years later, I'm working with football players which is soccer <laughs> football and they're from all over the world there are players from jamaica mexico the uk uh so literally i i've man I basically manifested that but i wasn't precise about it so really oh. with everything that i do now i'm very precise as far as like my goals my uh, my uh affirmations my uh visualizations i'm very precise about what i want i don't have my helicopter yet but hopefully one day um, I was just going to say, I, I didn't see the helicopter pad on the roof of your building, but I mean, it could be there. It's a cool, it's the coolest building ever. But you know what? When, when I go to the U, my view, my, my window is right at the helipad, right where the helicopters land. <laughs> I get to see them every time I'm over there, when they land, when they take off. And it's a, it's a nice reminder to let me know that that's still in my vision. <clears throat> that's cool. Yeah. I'm glad you shared that with us, Edgar. That was yeah. a great way to close this off. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. So how can somebody find you if they're like, hey, this sounds like something I need. I'm ready to try um, Edgar's style of massage therapy. How can our listeners find you, Edgar? Yeah, and I don't know how broad your guys' audience is, but I have people that fly in for a week, week and a half to take care of some of this, the issues that they have going on. So that's open. That's open to the public. But 
Uh, my website's NeuroMuscleWorks, all one word together, NeuroMuscleWorks.com. Um, I have a small Instagram page, um, NeuroMuscleWorks, as well. Um, if people want to follow me on my personal page, which uh, I have a pretty good following on that, that's uh, Eddie27one, or one, so eddie twenty seven one. Um, I post quite a bit on that as well, as far as what I do here and the athletes that I work with. But yeah, if people want to reach out through neuromuscleworks.com or, you know, find me through the, the Instagram or Facebook, I don't think I have a, well, actually I do have a Facebook, but uh, that's all in Spanish. So if you guys speak Spanish, you guys can follow me there. Um, but my Instagram is, is in English and my website's in English as well. And you're also on LinkedIn. I am. Yeah. Yeah. So that's also a small following. I'm, I'm not as active on there as I should yeah. be, but I'm definitely on LinkedIn as well. Well, I have not followed you on Instagram yet, so look for new followers. For sure. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much, Edgar. Well, thank you. I appreciate your time, and I hope you have a great weekend with your families. Likewise. All right.